Welcome, everyone. It's my great pleasure uh, to welcome all of you to our symposium for today. Uh, my name is Jamie Monson. Uh, I'm the director of the African Studies Center at Michigan State University. I'm also a professor of history, and I'm also the chair of the advisory board, or the executive board, rather, for the Chinese in Africa, Africans in China Research Network, uh, which is the host of this event. So we're really delighted to have you here today for our panel titled Africa Looking East, a global history, bringing a very important uh, historical perspective on, on Africa-China engagement. And also I'm very proud to say featuring some wonderful new emerging scholars in the field of China-Africa history, um, who some are just uh, finished their PhDs and going to share some fresh and exciting new research with us today. Um, I want to give thanks to Roberto Castillo uh, and to the Chinese in Africa, Africans in China Symposium Planning Committee. This is the fifth event in our online symposium series, and we hope that uh, you will continue to participate and join um, our events going forward. This event is also being recorded, um, and so there will be a recorded version made available. So we will follow the order of uh, speakers that was in the advertisement uh, uh, brochure, uh, with uh, starting with Liu Xiaonan, who is from Beijing Normal University, then Andrea Kifiasi, who's just finished his PhD, congratulations, uh, Andrea, and now back home in Tanzania at the University of Dar es Salaam in the Department of History. Jody Yujo Soon, who's at Fudan University, and Majun La, who's at Shandong Academy of Social Sciences. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started so that we will have time for all of the presentations. I'm going to share a PowerPoint. And I'm going to talk briefly about what inspired this panel and the title of this panel. I'm going to talk briefly um, about uh, my part of a project that I'm doing together with uh, Shaonan, and then he's going to take it away and finish up um, uh, talking about that. So uh, let me uh, share my screen with you. I hope this will... Um, um, work. Hold on just a moment. I'm sorry, I need to uh, prepare something here. Great. Shoot, I'm having trouble sharing my screen. Just a moment. Um, Try once again. It's it's there. It's there, Jamie. Now we, we can see it now. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Sometimes I have difficulty with this. Great, wonderful. So um, let me start then um, by introducing briefly. Um, why uh, we decided to come up with this particular idea for a panel. Um, and uh, there are two reasons, I think. One is the importance now, I think, of recognizing these um, exciting young scholars that are now uh, doing research in the history of China-Africa engagement. Um, and the inspiration for this also came from the increase increasing number of references in the media and discourse about the China-Africa relationship. There's a lot of talk, and there has been for a number of years, about, about China being a new imperial actor or a new colonial actor in Africa. And there's been a lot of framing of the contemporary China-Africa engagement using historical references. And so uh, Shaonan and I, in our project, we agree wholeheartedly that a historical perspective is needed and required in, under to, in order to understand contemporary China-Africa engagements. However, we also believe that the references to a scramble or to the new Cold War or to colonialism 
tend to reinforce a tendency to see Africa as a kind of passive, um, uh, a passive, uh, inactive uh, place that doesn't have its own agency, a continent that's being acted upon by external actors. Um, and this, this reinforces a stereotype that has been with us uh, for a pretty long time. So what we want to do in our work um, is to frame this question in terms of Africa at the center, reversing the gaze. So it's not seeing Africa as a passive actor with external um, agents sort of acting upon the continent, but rather putting Africa at the center. And we are inspired by Africanist historian, Judith Byfield, who talks about the importance of global historical processes and seeing Africa really at the center as a way of disrupting some of these conventional views. I want to talk too about the title of our panel, which is in relationship to um, a new book project that Shannon and I are working on. And we were inspired very much by uh, an Americanist historian who wrote an influential book called Facing East from Indian Country. In Daniel Richter's book, he discusses how the history of the United States is often written as a history of outside uh, settlers or colonizers coming in and that the United States was really created through the energy of westward expansion. So the energy and dynamism of American history in the, in the time of settlement is most often viewed as um, this sort of expansion from east to west. So Daniel wrote a book that really upended the way we think about the history of the Americas, uh, where he talked about what it might look like from the Indian perspective, the Indian gaze kind of looking east. And so we wanted to take this idea and think about writing the Africa-China historical narrative from a similar uh, eastward facing gaze, uh, which explains uh, why we picked this, this title for, for our, our panel today. So in our project, Xiaonan's gonna talk about his part and I'm just gonna briefly share uh, one of the chapters that I've been working on. And um, Xiaonan's gonna talk about some of the earliest sort of uh, pre-modern or pre-colonial history. And I wanna uh, share a little bit with you about a chapter that I've been completing about Sugar Islands. I think a lot of the time the historical narrative does begin with some pre so-called pre-modern or very early history of connection. And then it kind of jumps to post-colonial connections. Maybe it, it passes through the period of Zhenghua, you know, the sort of medieval imperial fleets. But then there's a period of a couple of centuries where there's really not a lot of historical development. And what I'm trying to highlight is that during the era of European imperialism, uh, the, the, the global slave trade, uh, and leading up to the era in the 19th century of abolition and legitimate trade, Africans and Asians were together in many global spaces. Uh, they were together in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, South Asians were, were together with Africans in Durban, South Africa. But Africans and Asians were together on sugar plantations from the Indian Ocean Islands of places like Mauritius all the way to Cuba. And I want to make sure that this period of engagement of Africans and Asians is understood, not only because it contributed very significantly to the production of wealth and profit through the oppression and exploitation of labor, but also because many of the ideas and discourses about race and labor and class and hierarchy that are influencing us through to today emerged at that time. Um, and this is something that Shaunan has also um, written about. So I won't go into this in depth, but just to give you a flavor of what um, I think is significant about this era is that in the 19th century, not only because of abolition, but also because of, of Africa descended people resisting and rebelling against enslaved conditions in places like Haiti, um, and, 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 and Jamaica, um, there, was, there was a period of, of labor crisis and that crisis was filled uh, to, to some extent with um, Chinese indentured workers. 
And uh, we are showing that in some places, especially in Cuba, not only um, did indentured labor um, replace uh, African enslaved labor, but actually Chinese indentured workers worked side by side in Cuba with enslaved Africans and uh, free African descended workers. Uh, and so I think that um, it's important to highlight that the demonization, dehumanization and impression of, of labor in sugar was really strengthened by the coexistence of these different forms of labor exploitation. And then the other important point, as I said, is that this work didn't just produce sugar, it also produced ideas about humanity that really shaped some of the fundamental um, concepts that uh, legitimized uh, empire and colonialism. Um, and this was generated not only uh, externally, but the workers themselves through their resistance also challenged and shaped these uh, hierarchies and stereotypes. And Xiaonan's writing about this for um, the history of Chinese labor in South Africa. So in the kind of civilizing discourses that legitimized colonialism, Africans and Asians could be framed against each other. Asian workers were depicted as disciplined, hardworking, but also um, in, in negative ways as immoral, uh, not able to be assimilated and Africans were depicted as lazy, um, uh, backward, uh, and, and, um, and, and not having a disciplined character. And both Africans and Asians were framed in this way as inferior to Europeans, and therefore their protection or their tutelage, um, especially for Africans, was needed. So a benevolent uh, European presence uh, was framed as part of this discourse as well. And I, I think we can easily see the ways that some of this discourse uh, remains with us today. So I'm gonna stop there. I've said too much probably, just wanted to give you a flavor of introduction and I will now hand over to my colleague and project partner, uh, Leo Shannon. So take it away, Shannon. Uh, thank you, Professor Monson. Uh, I'm going to share my PowerPoint here. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Monson, for the introduction. Uh, and in our project, I'm, uh, I'm doing one of the early chapters and we are trying to uh, recenter Africans in this early Africa-China interaction. And we both know Zheng He and we all know the Gama. And the 15th century seems to be the century of discovery, you know, for both European and Chinese explorers. But sometimes, you know, with too much attention on the European and the Chinese side, gives us a falsified impression of the pre-15th century Africa-China engagement. So what about Africans? Actually, uh, before the 15th century, Africans were in no way passive and static only waiting to be discovered. Instead, African sailors, African merchants, and slaves from the Swahili coast had long been an integral part of the Indian Ocean uh, exchange from 2000 years ago. And they had managed to reach China as early as the seventh century. So here I'm going to talk a little bit about the larger picture of the Indian Ocean uh, exchange and I'm trying to represent, you know, trying to rethink the story of Du Huan and how we should think about this uh, sucral narrative and, uh, you know, Africans in ancient uh, China. Okay, uh, so uh, we all know that, you know, Indian Ocean is a huge contact zone in which uh, East Africans, uh, Arabians, Persians, Indians, Indonesians and Chinese, and you know, have, they have long been part of this exchange for quite a long time. And you know, there were a lot of communication and interaction of peoples and products. And basically before the coming of the Portuguese, that, a, that was an open sea. And there had already been some of the, these indirect trading connections between Africa and China. And back then, historians used to see uh, Aden as a uh, gateway of China, and Adulis was seen, you know, as the port towards the Indian Ocean. 
Uh, back then, uh, Ceylon was the hub between Africa and China. Uh, both Ethiopian and Chinese traders came to Ceylon with, uh, uh, with their own goods, but back then no uh, direct human encounter yet. So here, uh, I'm going to just you know, jump to Du Huan due to the time. And uh, uh, since the, the seventh century, with the rise of the Abbasids and the Tang Dynasty, Africa-China interaction kind of achieved a new level. In the mid eighth century, Du Huan became the first uh, documented Chinese who, who visited Africa. And he traveled to West Asia and Africa between 751 and 762. And he wrote down his experience in Jing Xingji, which is a record of my travels. And that was the earliest solid uh, Chinese account about Africa. However, Du Huan, he did not intend to be an international traveler in the, in the first place. Actually, you know, he was initially taken around the world as a captive. So <clears throat> this was uh, his route, you know, around the world. You know, first as a Tang military officer, Du Huan participated in the Battle of Talas in Central Asia between the Abbasids and Tang. The Tang army was defeated and he was captured by the Arabs in 751. Then Du Huan was taken uh, to Samarkand and then to Merv and then to Kufa and finally to Baghdad. So, but we have to say, you know, Du Huan as a captive, he was pretty well treated. And in the later years, he, would, he might serve as a member of the embassy's a military mission. And he traveled from Baghdad to Levant and then down to Egypt and Sudan and, and Ethiopia. And after 12 years of travel, Du Huan was then allowed to return to China in 762, but he did not follow his original route of Ireland. Instead, he boarded on a ship and he came back you know, from the ports around the Red Sea and go back to Guangzhou. So um, here, I, we can find that basically, uh, du Huan's route kind of fit quite well with the land Silk Road and the Maritime Silk Road. And here we can see Du Huan, especially here in China, Du Huan was widely celebrated as the first Chinese walking along the Silk Roads. But, you know, this thing kind of, it was laden with some sort of China-centered uh, perspective. Because we know the name Silk Road for the Asian trading networks was raised by a German ge uh, a geographer, and the term itself is sort of uh, China-centered because you know there there were so many different types of products along these trading networks. You know, there are products from uh, Europe and from Asia, but you know people call it uh, the Silk Road. So. Here, what I'm trying to convey is that the circular narrative sometimes become a one-way story of Chinese products and explorers reaching East African coasts, just as its contemporary counter counterpart, you know, a story of Chinese merchants' aid, investment, and in, in, in infrastructure coming to Africa in the 21st century. So, in fact, the story of Du Huan in the Silk Road narrative was a, essentially a Chinese explorer following the Silk Road over land, reaching and discovering East Africa, and then safely came back via the Maritime Silk Road. In other words, his story is part of the China-centered uh, Silk Road narrative with little African uh, agency taking into uh, consideration. So we kind of need to uh, realize the limitation of these pre-modern pre Chinese sources and look beyond a uh, Duhuan's narrative into a more balanced, a more Africa-oriented uh, uh, perspective. And here, you no, know, an often overlooked fact was that you know, Du Huan, he was only one of very, very few recorded Chinese who had been to Africa uh, before Zheng He. And an even more overlooked fact was that you know, from the other end of 
the maritime Silk Road, hundreds, maybe thousands of African traders and sailors, you know, they had kept coming to China over uh, several centuries. So that's what I'm going to talk about in the next part about Africans in ancient China. Okay, uh, in ancient China, uh, basically Africans or black people, they were all referred to as Kunlun. And here, Kunlun is a general term describing all black and dark skinned peoples from a vast geographical uh, area from Southeast Asia, uh, westwards to East Africa. So it could be peoples from Southeast Asia, but it also has a solid record that you know, it referred to people uh, from Africa. And here, uh, for the Asian Chinese people, before the coming of this modern concept of race in the 19th century, uh, they kind of differentiated different ethnic groups based, based on whether they accepted the agriculture, a civilization, and the Confucian uh, uh, culture. So in short, although Kunlun, this word did indicate some physical difference of pre-modern pre uh, black people, but it's rather a cultural marker than a racial one. And uh, there were a lot of um, Africans um, in ancient China, and they were involved in many different types of professions, like uh, being diplomats, traders, sailors, uh, musicians, and farmers, and servants, some even as uh, legendary heroes in ancient uh, Chinese novels. And the earliest uh, Africans who had been to China were two African envoys. One was in 628 and the other in, was in 636. So that means these two African envoys, they actually arrived in China more than 100 years earlier than Du Huan set his foot on Africa. And here we are going to you know, more focus on the case of the African traders. And I want to share with you this very interesting story here. So you can read this story from uh, the PowerPoint. And you know, during the Tang Dynasty and Song Dynasty, the majority of foreign merchants in Guangzhou were Arabian, Persian, and Javanese. But there were solid accounts recording Kunlun merchants in China. So here is a very well recorded, recorded story of Kunlun merchant assassinating the Guangzhou governor. So from this story, we can basically see uh, three facts. First, Guangzhou was a very busy and a very prospering international uh, trading city uh, back then, like 1000 years ago, just like now. Uh, second, the Guangzhou official was very corrupted in you know, allowing mail trading and extorting all the foreign traders. And third, all traders, they were very angry and one Kunlun trader just stood out uh, and killed the governor and then and they went away. So from this story and other records, we could conclude that Kunlun traders were part of the Guangzhou foreign a merchant community from the seventh century onwards, and there was a certain chance that you know they came from Africa. Okay, uh, to the time, I think I would just jump to the conclusion. So here we are. What we are trying to convey here is that you know Africans had long been a part of the Indian Ocean exchange, and we need to uh, you know rethink a, a Du Huan story. You know Du Huan. Uh, his legendary story as the first Chinese reaching Africa was memorable, but Africans not only arrived at China a century earlier than Du Huan got to Africa, it was also Africans who made up the majority of this Africa-China interaction uh, before Zheng He. So if we, you know, it, judging from the number of Chinese and Africans using this route, it's rather a story of many Africans coming to China than one or very few Chinese are going to Africa. So here we are trying to, you know, recenter uh, Africans in this uh, early uh, Africa-China interaction. Uh, this is uh, my presentation. Uh, uh, thank you.